one of our incredible professors. He's gonna, he's Dr. Pike, Dr. David Pike. Um, he will have a presentation followed by a Q&A on supply chain risk management. So very fitting um, conversation, definitely. Um, that will be followed by our assistant dean, Dr. Casey Hayes, who will be introducing other faculty members who are here tonight, spotlighting them. They'll be able to share a little bit about their experience at USD, um, and then each one of them will jump into a breakout room session to represent specific programs. We have 13 breakout sessions, and I'm gonna be talking about them a little bit more now. Um, you'll be able to spend time there, jump from one session to another, and then at the very end, and you know, take advantage of that, ask questions to our current students, faculty, again, staff, if you have any admissions questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, but really take this opportunity to talk to our current students, professors, and you know, kind of get there, what, what does it mean like to be part of USD? And then we'll all reconvene back um, for, for, to end this, uh, this night together. So, um, Dr. Pike, I have the, the really, I have had the pleasure of working with him for the past few years, is um, Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management here at USD. He was our Dean of the School of Business between 2008 and 2015, and he was really instrumental in this very transformative period for our business school, during which um, he was able to lead us to a significant presence in international rankings. Dr. Pike holds a bachelor's in sociology from Haverford College, an MBA from Drexel University, and a PhD in decision sciences from Wharton. Dr. Pike is loved, truly loved by our students. He in fact won numerous professor of the year awards. And um, his classes are combining truly his knowledge and research and everything he brings from years of research with also his um, extensive experience in consulting. So again, I um, have the pleasure of introducing him. He will be focusing on risk management in supply chain. Again, make it as interactive as possible. Make sure that you chat your questions and I'll be happy to um, uh, pose them to him. So Dr. Pike, I'll leave it to you. PowerPoint slide. Can you see that slide now? Just nod your head up and there. okay, that's good. So it's, uh, that's man over technology, <clears throat> which uh, in this new regime that we have is, um, is uh, been um, quite a learning curve for some of us. We're used to and love the uh, in-classroom experience with our students. So what I wanna do uh, is uh, talk a little bit about supply chain risk. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time. And, uh, and I'm gonna do two things uh, with you. I'm, I'm gonna describe a little bit about a, uh, a, an exercise I do. It's an in-class exercise with my uh, electives, uh, elective students in the MBA program on enterprise risk management. And um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll give you kind of the light version of what we do. I don't wanna go into too much detail uh, because of time. But, uh, and then I'll take a couple steps back and, um, and we'll talk about uh, enterprise risk management in general. This turns out to be uh, something we've thought about for a long time and, and I've uh, worked with executives um, teaching them and teaching MBA students uh, in this particular format. Um, but um, but um, it's incredibly relevant as you will see um, in just a minute. So here's what I do. Uh, this, is, this is the quick version. Uh, of what I do. I, I describe, uh, it's kind of a composite company, I would say. It's not a, an exact one company, but a representative company of, um, uh, of furniture products that are not the low-end kind of, you know, cheap stuff, but also not very high-end uh, products. So call it middle range products that you might find at an Ikea. What you see on the screen in front of you is uh, uh, images from uh, target. So that, that kind of um, type of product, you can see they're made from wood or press board, metal parts, and things like that. And, and I describe uh, a, a company that produces in China and sells in Europe and the U.S. And so uh, the suppliers for this company, uh, get, they get wood primarily from Siberia. It comes in by train uh, to the factories in China. 
uh, and uh, then a whole host of other parts, the metal parts, the bent metal, the nuts and bolts and fabrics and things like that, that come from other places, primarily in China, but other places in Asia. We have two manufacturing plants, one in Kunming, I'll show you a, a, a map in just a second, and one in Guangzhou. And we sell to companies in Europe and the United States, mostly third party distributors or um, big box stores like a Target or something like that. So it's not to little mom and pop retail shops um, and uh, it's not to the Walmarts, uh, I'm higher than that. Um, but, um, but those kinds of, of high volume um, uh, outlets. And you can see that we compete on price quality and availability. In other words, if our, if our cost goes up and we have to raise our price uh, very much, we're gonna lose. Uh, to our competitors. We're just, we're not, we're not going to be able to survive in the market. On the other hand, if we tried to take our products to a, a developing uh, market where the furniture manufacturing was not quite as sophisticated as it is in, in China, uh, we might lose quality and that would certainly lose us sales. And, uh, and in addition, uh, for in Indonesia, for instance, if we went to Indonesia, it's highly likely that a four, six, eight week lead time would be extended by another four weeks or so and go to 12 weeks. Uh, and, and our availability might be challenged. We might be able to be responsive enough to our customers. So all of these things go in the background uh, as I describe that we enter the, um, the exercise uh, in the classroom. Then what, oh, sorry, here's the map. So I'm gonna just, I, can you see my little nod your head if you, okay, good. So here's Kunming down in Southwest China. We actually had friends who taught English there for a long time. And uh, here's Guangzhou just up the river from Hong Kong. So a big, big um, uh, manufacturing area. I've been there, I actually wrote a case on Guangzhou, Guangzhou Machine Tool Works number one, creative uh, name for that factory. And just because of today, here's Wuhan which has um, been in the news, as you know, a lot um, recently. So uh, here's the way the exercise works. I give that background about the company so they know kind of what we're talking about and, and the, the nature of the supply chain and that sort of thing. And then I divide the room up into tables. So there's, a, there's a group for operations and supply chain. Uh, there's a table for sales and marketing. There's a table for finance and one for human resources. If I have enough people, and especially if it's an executive audience, uh, I'll often have a table that I call either the CEO or the board of directors. So they're the, the quite clearly the general management um, uh, perspective, uh, we hope, would have the general management perspective. And so what I do is I show a headline. I'm going to give you some examples of uh, some of the headlines I show. I won't, I won't do them all, and they're, they're more elaborate than this, but but I'll give you some examples and uh, you'll be amazed um, But um, that uh, what I was dreaming up uh, four or five years ago and been using ever since uh, is happening as we speak today, worse actually. Um, so then I show a headline, we go to tables and I ask them, given what you just saw in that headline, would you um, uh, do anything from your perspective uh, and so the reason I do this with my second year MBAs is that it, it's kind of hard to expect first year MBAs or undergraduate students for that matter to be able to just be put at a table uh, on operations and supply chain or sales and marketing or HR or whatever if they don't have any experience at all. But, but once you've been through the first year of the MBA program, you will have a lot of experience uh, with a lot of these different functional areas and should be able to take the, the role of someone sitting in that position at this global corporation. Then we come back and we share ideas around what would you do and, and, um, and then react to, e uh, to each other. And, um, and then if we have a CEO or a board of directors table, they can ask questions of any table and, and kind of bring new perspective to it. Then I show another headline. Then we go back to the tables. Then they decide what would we do now, if anything, and, uh, and come back and share and so on. And the, the bottom line, before I showed you, I'll just get to the bottom line up front, but, but the bottom line basically is this. I really, really want uh, our, our students who graduate or the executives I teach with this um, to be the ones in the room who are taking the broad perspective for the entire corporation, the whole enterprise. 
And what I've seen interviewing uh, uh, directors of companies and CEOs is almost, this is not entirely true, but almost everyone that I have talked to uh, makes their decisions in functional silos. They're worried about audit and errors in the financial statement. They're worried about supply chain. They're worried about marketing. And they do not think in an integrated way when they're making these uh, decisions in preparation for and responding to risk. And so the, the goal of, of all this exercise is that, that now when you go back to your company or when you graduate and go out into a company, you're the one saying, let's get out of our silos and let's make a, a co comprehensive uh, risk management decisions. So here's the first uh, headline that I show. Heavy snows in Siberia shut down highways and rail lines within Russia and into China. Subtitle, authorities confident they will open in four days. So we go off to tables. You might have the HR teams, HR teams say something like, well, you know what, if, if there's no materials, we're not going to allow you to work any overtime. Uh, you might have the supply chain team saying, let's just check and make sure we have enough inventories of raw materials so we can keep our people busy. You might have the marketing team say, sales team say, hey, do you have enough inventory to ship on time? Those kinds of things. So there would be those kinds of relatively minor, uh, common kinds of discussions that would happen with an event like this. Let me go back to the whole group and I show them this headline. And you can see the date that I made up for this headline, May 20th, 2014. So we're talking six years ago. Medical authority, and so I made this up. Of course, you, yeah, it's not, you know, there have been various avian flus, but um, medical authorities report outbreak of a new avian influenza virus in Southwest China. Thousands of chickens dead or destroyed, no reported cases in humans. What would you do? So then we take five minutes, eight minutes, and go off and, and, uh, and teams decide what they would do. Oftentimes, in this case, it's we won't do anything. Maybe we better check and make sure, you know, we have enough masks around, or does anybody live on a chicken farm who works in our factory? That kind of thing, but, but uh, maybe nothing at all. I will add, by the way, that I often put something in uh, a second headline on these slides that have to do with potential fluctuations in currency exchange, which brings that finance team in to think about hedging uh, uh, the Rimby dollar and see um, if they would have any uh, comments on that. But I'm not gonna go there today. Next headline, first human infections from the new avian influenza virus in Southwest China. It's a mutation of the H5N, H5N1 virus and that uh, humans are uh, the farm workers near Kunming where our factory is. But there are no reported cases of human to human transmission. You can imagine what I was feeling when the COVID-19 thing started to hit in China. And I'm thinking, this is the exact thing that I do with my uh, students and, uh, in these classes. And then the last one I show, uh, WHO classifies it as phase four, which is human to human transmission and possible community level outbreaks. Lots of cases and schools and universities are closed. And now we go off into our groups. And as this thing progresses, the whole point is that students begin and executives begin to see, boy, I wish we had had this conversation before. And if they walk away with that, I'm a happy man. Okay, let me show you just, I'm gonna give you a brief taste because I'm gonna run out of time here. So uh, when, we, when we finish this with executive audience, it's a whole morning, but um, with MBAs, it might be an hour and a half or a three hour type class. We'll talk about enterprise risk management in general. Um, and so I give you just a taste of it and then I won't spend any more time. Uh, I'll let you ask questions. But risk is defined as the probability of an event times the impact of the event. And what that means is if you're going to manage risk, you need to identify potential events. What could go wrong? Uh, a snowstorm, no big deal. Um, uh, a human to human transmission of uh, influenza may be a big deal. COVID-19 may be a huge deal. Uh, an earthquake or a volcano in Iceland, you name it, uh, the events can cascade in terms of uh, how, how big they are. So identify the events as a team in your company, assess their likelihood, and assess their impact on you as a company. And then uh, prepare in your risk response. Is there any way we can avoid it? Do we just have to accept it? Is there a way can, that, that we can share that risk with an insurance company, for instance? 
uh, with the suppliers or whatever, or reduce the likelihood or reduce the impact. And then if it all happens and we couldn't take it away, how are we gonna react and recover? And a good risk management program will have all of those things as part of it and will kick into gear when COVID-19 hits or some other event, a snowstorm or a, a volcano or a tsunami, they'll kick into gear their risk program and, uh, and risk response. And what uh, I do when I talk about this, particularly from the supply chain perspective, is that uh, there are common events that happen every day. Shipments are delayed, some inventory goes missing, the machine breaks down, currencies uh, uh, fluctuate. Those things are common things and there's a set of tools that we use that are common tools. Build inventory, have a little extra capacity, uh, hedge your currency, those kinds of things. And then there are low probability black swan type events, pandemics, tsunamis, hurricanes, political instability uh, that use hard to predict. They're low probability, but the impact can be actually quite high. And I'm gonna stop with this slide uh, rather than go on just because of the clock. But um, uh, what I have companies do then, managers do, is, is, is basically use stickies, post-it notes, identify the risk and place it on this diagram. So you have in the very upper right-hand corner, almost certain probability with extreme impact. Well, that's a severe issue and you better work on that one. You have, I would say, uh, where we are right here uh, with uh, the with, uh, coronavirus is probably down in the bottom right, very rare maybe not so rare as we had thought, but anyway, um, and, uh, but the impact is, is extreme. And so the whole exercise is who on your team or what sub teams or task force are gonna, are gonna take those stickies and by the work they're doing, basically move them into a lower impact. What can we do to lower the impact, to be prepared and to do that in a cross-functional way so that it's not just uh, the supply chain team sitting around the table, but they're interacting with marketing and finance and HR and so on. And I think given what time it is, I, I will just stop there. And uh, I think Diana, are you firing questions to me or comments? And you are muted. So I'm watching your mouth move, but Great, now I'm unmuted. Thank you, you Vicky, yeah. for unmuting me. Uh, yes, I am happy to redirect to Dr. Pike all of your questions. All right, Good I'm going to go to stop share and take that off. So, um, and make sure I'm happy with where I stopped. I'm good. Okay. Any questions for Professor Pike? Participation is very important in grad program, so everyone should start practicing. <laughs> uh, while you think, I'm gonna share with you a headline that was from the Wall Street Journal yesterday, uh, and it read this. California was ready for virus, then it wasn't. State had plenty of emergency supplies, then got rid of them. I don't know if you saw that headline and read that article, but um, the point was, that uh, back in the days when uh, we had a budget surplus, dramatic budget surplus in California, uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger saw the, um, saw the uh, massive um, disruption that came, I think it was from SARS, but I don't remember which one it was. And he said, oh, it might've been the Hurricane Katrina actually. And he said, we gotta get ahead of this. And so, um, and so uh, they basically put millions, tens of millions of dollars into get this N95 masks and ventilators and other emergency mobile hospital units that could be set up with emergency room surgery units in them. And uh, over time, anybody who's spending money uh, to maintain that equipment looked like a bum because now the, the state is under a tremendous budget pressure. And so they got rid of all that stuff, not all, but it, it, uh, it went out of uh, date, expiration date went by. And now it, and, or they sold it or gave it away or threw it away. And now um, there's, it's not there. 
And so the big, big issue for these uh, black swan type events is you don't look like a hero when you spend $50 million preparing for something unless the event happens. And then you look like a hero. Uh, the problem is you probably got fired from your job for spending $5.8 million a year uh, to maintain something that nobody thinks is ever going to be used. So that's a big issue that's going on as we speak. And it's been not a little frustrating to, to watch it happen. Yeah. So Dave, we do have a couple of questions. All right. One from Richard that says, when consulting, how do you correct managers when you see the weight of risk or importance being grossly over or understated? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, when, when I work with companies, um, and I do a variety of things uh, from um, uh, broad strategic planning kinds of things. So I just did with WD40, which is a big San Diego company, a global supply chain strategy project. Um, and then I all the way down to uh, very tactical inventory management kinds of things or production scheduling. Um, I basically make sure that uh, whoever my sponsor is, uh, client at the company, is um, uh, very aligned with, uh, with what we're trying to do. So I might spend two, three, four hours with them. And if they decide that I can't help or I decide that I can't help, then we end the relationship no charge and it's all good. Uh, if they say, we think you can help, and I think I can help, then we really start to hone in on, um, on what the goals of the project are and that sort of thing. So my goal would be not to enter a situation where um, we are so far off with, uh, in terms of perspective that it's just going to be frustrating for them and frustrating for me. If you're on the inside, that's a different story. Uh, that's how do you manage up or how do you manage down? And that's, wow, good luck uh, with that. You'll get a lot of help when you come here on those kinds of issues. Great. And um, a question about international, basically, supply chain. So if a company like many has a supply chain that spreads over different countries, what is the importance of coordinating or designing risk policies with local governments? Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. So this is a good question. Uh, I hope you all come because you're going to have fun um, uh, driving your faculty crazy with questions. So, um, so this is a good one. Um, uh, it, 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 there are many cases um, uh, and that are enter entertaining or frustrating stories of, um, of companies that, are, that go into countries where they have no experience uh, or very limited experience. And my recommendation for them is hire somebody quickly who does. Uh, because um, you can run into just massive problems, just not understanding the culture. You don't understand the language. A lot of times Americans come in with sort of a arrogant perspective. You know, we're the best in the world, so we know, which is definitely not true. When you go to another country, they know better than you do. And, um, and so um, getting uh, uh, good help from local people who are either political leaders or business leaders, uh, consultants on the ground uh, can be a huge advantage and you would neglect that um, uh, at your peril. Uh, otherwise you're just going to run into conflict and delays and frustrations and that sort of thing. And another question, I know we're getting there with time, but what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen executives make when planning for risk management and how can we help them think differently? So it's another good question. Um, uh, for me, the uh, because this is just me, uh, because I've been um, I've been thinking about the integrated. My whole research ever since my dissertation, which is a long time ago, has uh, primarily been on uh, across discipline uh, uh, functional areas, and so um, and so my interest in risk management uh, developed because I was seeing. Uh, supply, uh, supply chain and operations managers handle risk and the salespeople that they interact with in the same company handle it so differently and they lie and, and they get frustrated with each other and it's just a disaster. And so um, for me, the, the biggest mistake I've seen, I'll give you two. Number one is just ignore it. Put your head in the sand. Say we don't have enough money 
to, uh, to put into a risk management program. Nobody has time, so let's just hope by the time I retire or go to another company, uh, the, the, the bad events don't happen. That's a huge mistake, obviously, and everybody's facing that today who uh, didn't plan ahead. The other one is the silos. Uh, where, um, where, where, you know, you just get, look, I like my friends in supply chain uh, or I like my friends in sales or in HR or whatever, and, and you don't think about the ripple effect of what you do. So if the supply chain team decides, you know what we're going to do, we're going to open a factory in, in Indonesia instead of China without working with the finance team who's got to deal with now a new currency, and fluctuations against the dollar with a new currency and with a marketing team that has to rebrand. We, we finally got our customers comfortable with made in China and now that we have to get them comfortable with made in Indonesia. Is that a problem? Maybe not. But if it is, you need to have that conversation in advance. And I, uh, as I said earlier, I've seen almost no cases where uh, uh, companies and managers have had those kind of in-depth conversations uh, in a proactive way. We have more questions coming in. Um, maybe the last one, and then I leave it to Dr. Hayes. So with the current situation, um, do you believe that the virus has displayed a problem with um, companies relying so heavily on production uh, in other countries? And do you think this current situation might cause a global shift of uh, where production will take place? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it, it, indeed, um, I, there are a lot of companies, uh, but this has been happening actually um, in the last, I'd say, decade. Uh, we saw a tsunami of, of companies leave the West, I'll speak to the US, leave the US and go to China. Some for great reasons, some for not great reasons. Uh, there has been, I would say, a stream, not a tsunami, uh, coming back because wage rates in China have gone up, uh, lead times are long. Uh, there are disruptions and, and that sort of thing. And so you're getting more in Costa Rica, Mexico, back in the U.S. and so on. And uh, I think the current situation has highlighted the fact that, um, that a lot of companies have a single supplier. And there's a lot of good reason for that because they're cheaper. I've got the best, cheapest supplier I can find in China or Vietnam or whatever. And uh, it's going to cost me more to have a second supplier in a different political region, geographic region, uh, different currency uh, closer to home, say in Mexico. It's just gonna cost more. And that's not gonna make me look good and, and I'm not gonna do it. Uh, and um, I, But there have been changes, including what I mentioned with wage rates and so on, that are causing companies to think about um, maybe developing second sources of supply or um, in fact, um, coming back home or near home. And I think that will continue. I think it's going to highlight um, the vulnerabilities. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not just China, it's anywhere where there's a single supplier where something could go wrong. And, um, and so I think that's going to highlight that and you're going to see companies make some different decisions. What I really truly think though is that the memory will be pretty short. I think in a few years, people will forget about it. Things will go back to normal and then the price pressure will be on and they'll just go back to the cheapest supplier. Hope not, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's likely outcome. Thanks, those are great questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pike. Dr. Pike will be in the professional MBA breakout room, so you can continue conversations there about this topic or about the program itself. I also saw a couple of questions related to structure of programs. So. Um, all of those things can be addressed in the different uh, specific program breakout rooms. So thank you again, Dr. Pike, and I'll thank leave you. it to Dr. Casey Hayes to introduce all of uh, our other wonderful faculty members. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Pike, um, for speaking with us. I know I learned something tonight, and hopefully uh, all of you have something that you could take away from that. Maybe it wet your palate to learn a little bit more about supply chain management. It is my pleasure to get to introduce you to the faculty who have joined us tonight that will be available to meet with you in all of our breakout rooms. As Deanna said at the beginning of the evening, one of the things that USD is known for is the personal connections that our students get to form with their faculty 
and with one another in our classroom environments. And so we're trying our best to emulate that experience for you tonight. A uh, lot different than it has been in years past, but we're so grateful to have so many of you joining us this evening. I'm gonna talk with you about each of the faculty who will be representing the different programs. So you might wanna keep this in mind as you make your decision as to which breakout rooms you might wanna to go to. Um, and many of the faculty are part of many of our different programs. So we're gonna start with the MBA tonight and we have Dr. Artie Ivanich and she is the academic director of our MBA programs um, and a faculty member in marketing, um, teaching in our MBA and uh, MS in business analytics programs. Dr. Ivanich, my question for you tonight is what is one piece of advice you would give to prospective graduate students? So many things to say. First of all, thank you all for being here. This is a new experience for all of us. Hopefully you're safe and healthy. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice that I would give is to be intellectually curious, ask questions. And as you're going through your career, as you're going through education, as you're deciding where to go to school, um, ask questions about why this is important, what sort of impact can you make on the world. I want to echo what Dr. Pike said earlier. Um, when I think of an MBA, it's about being interdisciplinary. So it's taking that broad view to try and figure out how do all of the disciplines interact and intersect with each other. And you figure that out only if you're intellectually curious. Great, thank you. Next, we have our Master of Science in Business Analytics program and representing that program tonight is Dr. Andrea Godfrey Flynn. Dr. Flynn was one of the members of our faculty who initiated the launch of our MS in Business Analytics program. And she also is a professor of marketing and also teaches in the MBA program. Dr. Flynn, thank you for being here. What makes students most marketable after graduation? Thanks, Casey, and welcome, everyone. It's really awesome to see such a great turnout tonight, and so far things are going so smoothly. So <laughs> it's a, definitely a fun new experience for all of us. Um, so to your question, Casey, I think there's two key things that help students um, get set up for success when they graduate. Um, the first is being data literate. So it doesn't matter now if you're talking about finance, marketing, supply chain, real estate, data is, um, I should say business is data driven now. So even if you're not planning to necessarily be the person who's doing all the number crunching and data analysis, you need to know what questions you can ask, how to apply data to help answer those questions, and in general, how you can put data to use to, to be more effective in your decision making. Um, my colleague who you just met, Professor Evanich, has a quote on her office door that I love from W. Edwards Deming that says, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So I think that's never been more true when it comes to the, the business world. Um, but the second piece, I think, is really having excellent communication skills. Um, so without those excellent oral written communication skills, you really only get so far with your um, career. There's, uh, you need to be effective working with teams and to eventually lead up through leadership roles in an organization. You need to be effective at telling stories, persuading, and motivating others. So it's that combination, that magic combination of the hard and soft skills that will really make students um, set up for success when they finish the program. Thank you, that is a perfect tie-in to my next question. For our next uh, representative, uh, Dr. Barbara Lugy is going to be representing the MS and Executive Leadership Program this evening. Dr. Lugy is our Associate Dean for Graduate Business Programs, overseeing the academic components of all of our programs, as well as all of our staff supporting the Graduate Business Programs. She also recently served as our Interim Dean in the School of Business for the last six months. Dr. Luji, why is it important for business students to improve their soft skills? Thank you, Casey, and good evening, everybody. Um, I think it's, before I answer the question, I think it's important for you to understand that I'm an accounting professor, and so I am all about numbers. But what I will tell you is that whenever we take a group of students to visit a company, whenever I talk to alumni, employers, uh, people on our board of advisors, the, one of the top characteristics they're looking for when they're looking to hire students is the ability to communicate the, and the ability to work well with others. So the other thing I will share with you is before I came to the University of San Diego, I took a break from my academic career and I worked at Morgan Stanley in New York. And 
the work we did was extremely technical. I was surrounded by extremely bright, motivated people. And what I will tell you is that the smartest person in the room was not the person who got promoted. It was always the people who had the ability to influence others and convince others that their perspective was the way to go. Those are the people who get promoted. So soft skills, extremely important. Ability for, to persuade others is critical for success in the business world. Thank you. And I did forget to say that she was a professor of accounting and teaches not only in the executive leadership program, but also in our MBA programs on occasion when she can. Dr. Dennis Zacco is here this evening representing the Master of Science in Finance. He also has taught in our MBA program, MS in Supply Chain Management, and many other programs. Um, and so tonight I'm going to ask Dr. Zacco, what is one opportunity that USD provides graduate students that is simply unforgettable? Thank you, Casey. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to talk about an unforgettable experience, not only for the students, but for faculty. And that's our study abroad program. I know we're subject to travel restrictions right now, but soon they will lift, hopefully. And when they do, the, there's incredible opportunities to take courses abroad. I've taught in, in many of the great cities of the world. And what a tremendous experience for our students to learn topics in our courses immersed in the cultures of these great cities. It, it just is uh, uh, a much deeper learning experience and you know, great kudos to our international program for making these opportunities available. And they are truly unforgettable. Great. And our international opportunities are another one of the breakout opportunities this evening, the Aller Center for International Business. Thank you, Dr. Zacco. We also have Dr. Charles Tu with us this evening. Dr. Tu is the uh, academic director of the MS in Real Estate program and a professor in real estate and finance, also teaches in the Master of Science in Finance and was uh, recently serving as our Associate Dean for Graduate Programs while Dr. Luji was our Interim Dean. Dr. Tu, why is it important for graduate students to put forth a professional image? Thank you, Casey, and good evening, everyone. I guess um, most of you are here this evening because you are considering returning to school or continuing your education because you want to advance your career, right? Uh, of course, that could mean many different things like finding a better job, having a chance to move up in the current organization, or maybe switching to a totally different career path. Um, what you want to do is to do the best you can to accomplish this goal by acquiring new knowledge, developing new skills, uh, expanding your network. And I think putting forth a professional image is also a very important part of it. I always remind my students that the entire time you're in a graduate program, when you interact with others, you could be inter interviewing for your next job. You could be working with future business partners. You could be meeting with a potential client. All the people around you, from faculty members, classmates, guest speakers, your mentor, even people you just meet at receptions, they could potentially provide the opportunity you need to advance your career. So you want to make a great first impression and equally important is to continue to maintain that positive image. And that is why professionalism is something that we emphasize in uh, among graduate programs at USD School of Business. And by the way, I think that process starts this evening if it hasn't already started. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Dr. Tu. And last but not least for our faculty this evening, we have Mr. Ray Hummel who is representing our Master of Science in Supply Chain Management. He is also an alum of our MBA programs. Uh, Mr. Hummel, how are USD students transforming lives through businesses and organizations? Well, I guess students' personalities and their experiences have a lot to do with it, but I also think what we teach helps a lot. 
So in our graduate programs like the Masters of Science and Supply Chain and the other ones represented here, we try to advance academic excellence and transformation by transferring, and this is the way I look at it, a philosophy, a methodology, and tools that we believe will allow these students to excel as employees, entrepreneurs, leaders, and more importantly, as good citizens. If preparation is 90%, then I believe we succeed in these programs. Um, I, re I was thinking today, if I remember correctly from my undergraduate years at Pomona College, I remember one of the teachers telling me in one of the classes that chance favors the prepared mind. So I looked that up today and that was Louis Pasteur. So that's very important, I think. And, um, and that has really benefited me in my life. I've just been, you know, I was there when certain opportunities came by and I wanna pay it forward. So that's why I teach. The professors and staff in the areas represented here today all have slightly different perspectives on this transformation. But I look at us as a cross-functional team with, with all of our goals aligned. Um, in our program and in the other programs, we encourage community, diversity, teamwork, international experiences, I think are really important. Uh, when I was an MBA here, I spent a semester in Paris, a semester in Hong Kong, and a semester in Monterey, Mexico. That had to be one of the greatest, well, the MBA here was a really great experience, I have to tell you that. Um, um, I currently teach strategic cost management and the integrated project in the master's program in supply chain management. I also teach multiple supply chain courses, the undergrad graduate program, and I was a corporate controller before I started teaching. Um, so I'm here to represent the MS in supply chain management and the university with Karen Kukta in the breakout room. Uh, I also was lucky enough to, to work with Dr. Burt who created the undergrad and graduate supply chain programs and this uh, hybrid master's program. So uh, it was a lot of fun, I learned a lot and contributed a little bit, I guess you'd say. So I look forward to speaking with you if you're interested in supply chain or anything else. Thank you. Thank you. So you've gotten a taste of the faculty who are here to meet with you during our breakout sessions. Most of you should have already been now assigned to a breakout session. So just wanted to remind you about what Deanna had shared at the beginning of our session today. Um, you, in a few moments, you will have something pop up on your screen that invites you to join your breakout session. So you're going to want to click into that session. Please know that all of our different sessions are being recorded. Um, and so if you ever wanted to try and see one of the ones that you may have missed, we could probably help you with that later on. When you're ready to leave that session, you can hit a button that says return to the main session. And then you can ask Carolyn to, Carolyn to uh, assign you to another breakout room. And then at that time, it won't be quite as automatic. It doesn't pop up right in front of you to join the breakout session, but I think you have to go to the bottom of your screen to hit uh, join the breakout session once you're moving to another session. Uh, so it will take a few seconds um, for Zoom to get us all into our different breakout sessions. Um, and so we just ask you to bear with us just a little bit, but in uh, people will go away and then we will pop into our breakout sessions. And I hope you have great conversations with our students, alumni, faculty, uh, and staff and administrators in all of our sessions. Hello, everyone. Good to be back in the room. So, let's see, see a chat here. Um, so I, we, we're going to wrap up everything now. Wanted to, to share here a screen um, showing, you know, this was the first of hopefully not too many Zoom, you know, open houses like this because we like to have you on campus. But at the same time, this, like I mentioned earlier, you know, um, being able to uh, transform challenges into opportunities, we were able to have people from also outside of San Diego joining us today. And it was great to see you. And it's great to see that you're all healthy and in a positive mindset. And um, so that, that's, um, that's great. But we do offer additional opportunities to learn more about specific programs. And you know, our team, the admissions team, is here to answer any questions you may have. Um, but also uh, make sure to join these specific info sessions. 
um, I want to really, again, I, I think that, you know, while we were not able to welcome you in person to our beautiful thing that, and USD is known for its beauty, I think that today we were able to show that what I think it's USD's greatest beauty is its um, community made up by our students, our professors, our staff, and everyone here on campus, even when we're not on campus. So thank you again to everyone. I also wanna let you know that um, we understand that there are additional and added challenges when it comes to um, applying to graduate programs right now due to the current situation. We have um, application fee waivers that are available. So just send an email to either the specific program of your interest or um, gradbiz at USD, uh, sorry, at San Diego.edu. Gradbiz at San Diego.edu. Let us know you participated in to this event and we'll be happy to send you um, application fee uh, waiver. And then I wanna say uh, thank you to everyone who participated again tonight. Thank you to my team, thank you to the professors, um, thank you to our um, centers of excellence and thank you to you uh, students and uh, future Toreros uh, for joining us today. And also shout out to Doris who was a person behind all of this and was able to send us back and forth uh, from one uh, breakout room to the other. And I think it went pretty smoothly. So thank you again, everyone. I'll see you soon.